And as you can see, there's a few chapters here with system configuration. So there's information here about the SysV init, how it works, a bit of history. Um, it seems like it's got more disadvantages than advantages. So it could be that the LFS team are preparing to make the system D their main um, way of, of starting up the system. So we've got some boot scripts that have been created by the LFS team save us the effort of creating them. So I'm back in the sources again. I just need to do as before, expand or extract the files within this tarball. So it's LFS boot scripts, change into it and run make install. And you can see those scripts have been installed there. We can now get rid of this directory. We don't need that. There's some information here about device handling, um, which is useful to read. Some more information there. Um, if you're just building bog standard Linux from scratch with you know single devices, such as net single network card and so on, you won't really need to read this. Um, if you have got multiple devices, you want to make sure they work as expected, then you'll need to read that and maybe um, make some changes to configuration files as, as it says in, in that page. So now we're going to actually create some of the configuration files and the first one is a network configuration file so what I tend to find is the easiest thing here to do is to copy and paste the um, config file and then actually edit it. Now, um, because the UDEV interface, um, it uses the um, like, um, device names that are based on the actual device and its location on the system bus. Um, so I go along with that. It's the new way of doing things. And the best way to find out the name of the device is to do IPA and you'll see the devices you've got here. So the first one is the loopback device. The second is the wired network device. And the fourth one is the uh, wireless device on this machine. So I want to activate the wired device and that's its name there. So what I need to do first of all is to rename that ifconfig file from .eth0 to ifconfig and the name of the interface. I then want to edit it and change the name here. Um, as you can see, this is static allocation. It's a lot simpler than having to install DHCP. It's just another package to install and configure. Um, so what you should do is try and find a spare IP address that you know won't be allocated to any other machine on your network. So if you've got a DHCPC server and you know it allocates IP addresses within a certain range, just pick an IP address that isn't within that range that's not used by another machine and that should be safe to use. So I'm going to use 200 and the gateway needs to be changed because that should be a zero. Likewise broadcast that should be a zero as well. So that's the config file that I'll be using. And there's some more information there about that. The etcresolve.conf, well, it's basically empty initially, just a few comments in there. But if I edit it, domain, give yourself a domain if you use it, otherwise, just delete it. 
So my domain I use is my net dot org and the name server is the IP address of your name server. You can either get that from your ISP, your internet service provider, or you can look at it on your internet modem, the device you use to connect to the internet um, at the phone line, the network equipment. Um, or you could use one of the free ones that are available on the internet. I think there's Cloudflare, Do One, Google Do One as well. Um, so it's your choice. I've got my own server, so I'll be using that. And I'll just be using that one, so I'll delete that other one. You can have any number of name servers and they get used in order, as far as I know. So I'll save that one. The host name we need to give the system a host name. So I could, for example, call this LFS 10.0, oh, sorry, 10.1, or 10-1. So that's created a file called hostname in etc with that name in it. Then we need to create a host file and we need to know the name that we just created because this will be used within this file. So I'm going to double click that to copy it just to be sure I don't change it accidentally. Um, and what I need to do now is to edit the etc hosts file to make some changes. So here I need to add in the fully qualified domain name. So that's the host name followed by the domain name. Uh, so dot mynet.org and then the host name just by itself. So these are all this means is these are ways of referring to this system. And then I need to allocate the same IP address that I used in the network setup. So it's 0200. Again, the fully qualified domain name and the host name. And then any further aliases. As I haven't got any other aliases, I'll just delete the rest of that line. And then also because I don't use IPv6, I'll get rid of these lines as well. Next we've got a um, init tab that's used for sysv init, just copy and paste that in. You'll notice that the first terminal, which is the default one when it boots, has got this no clear option, so that enables you to see um, any messages that have appeared when the boot scripts are running. Um, if that's a security issue for you, you can um, just delete that, that um, switch from there. So there's a clock configuration file here. Now this is um, something that needs to be looked at carefully because um, you can cause problem with the clock. It can get stuck behind or or ahead um, if you've got other operating systems on the same machine, um, especially Windows. So if I edit this. Um, what you need to do is to change the UTC option at the top where it says UTC equals 1 and change that to a 0 if you have Windows on the same computer as this Linux from scratch installation. Um, and as it says there, set it to zero if it's not set to UTC time. So by default, all Linux systems use UTC time, which is why it's set to one as default. Um, 
that's what I'm going to leave this as because there won't be any other other systems such as Windows that uses local time, which is when you set it to zero. So if you do have Windows and you boot to Windows on the same machine, um, you need to set that to zero. Um, there's some other parameters can be set there. I've never had to use that option. It does suggest that alphas may need that. And there's a link there for some hints on how to deal with time um, on Linux from scratch. So there's no changes there, but I'll just save that anyway. The Linux console. Um, now this is a bit I always get stuck with. I don't do this very often and I have to try and remember what settings I need to use. So what I'll do is just copy that in and then I'm going to edit that file and just make some changes to it um, because the default information that's gone in there is for um, a Polish keyboard this key map. So what I need to do is change that to UK for United Kingdom and then the fonts I need to change as well. Um, in fact I think by default that will work uh, for UK but I do need to change the character encoding because um, Poland's in Eastern Europe, the dash 2 is for Eastern Europe, I'm in Western Europe so that needs to be changed to a 1. Now regarding fonts, um, you can set larger fonts in this file by changing this font map where it says LAT 2A. Um, if I can remember where they are, probably the best thing is if I copy this, search for it. So find from the root, oops. you can see this has got a default keyboard of, uh, default US keyboard, so this is why I keep on having the wrong symbols appear. Right, okay, so that's the locations there, so if we look at the contents of that directory, you'll see there's a host of other fonts that you can use and basically you just use the first part of each of these files um, and that's the name you put in that console configuration file and the numbers afterwards refer, well when it's a single number it refers to the number of lines in the font so uh, for example this one with 16 is a VGA font because that's how many lines a VGA character has by standard the 14 is EGA um, I think the 12 would work in EGA as well and then 10 you're getting lower and lower resolution the 8 would be for CGA um, the smaller ones would just adjust the number of lines on the terminal now I want a larger font so these ones with two numbers that says that the font is 8 by 16 pixels which again is standard VGA 8 by 8 would be quite tiny I think that's CGA resolution but I want a nice big font. This one is really big, um, as I found out a few weeks ago. So you probably don't want to use that one um, on a normal console. I think that would be a good font to use um, if you had a media server where the, the screen is several feet away from your face. That, that would certainly be a good font to use. So what I find is a, quite a decent sized font is this one here. Now I normally set the font in the kernel because there's a nicer font in there that didn't seem to be available within these files but this Sun one is quite a nice font and it's a reasonable size as well, it's not too big, um, not too small really, it's a little bit too small for me on some screens but it's, it's a good compromise. So I've highlighted that, all I need to do is to go back to this console um, screen and what I'm going to do is delete this and then paste it and then 
just remark that one out because that's the default if I can find what the hash is yeah that's the hash now I can change this and I've still got a record of the original console fonts in case I have a problem with this one so that should be sufficient to give me a a decent size font on a larger screen high density uh, higher DPI screen and I've also set the character map to Western Europe you need to investigate what would be more appropriate to you there's lots of examples here actually um, for different areas one last thing I'm going to add I'll add this at the top here is there's another option called log level and if you set that to 3 um, what it means is you, you don't get some of the kernel messages that appear on the screen um, when you're booting and sometimes like if you plug a USB stick in you'll get a kernel message and instead of appearing at it appearing to the screen it, it will be suppressed um, you'll still get the messages in the message so you'll still be able to view them there but it just stops um, uh, unsolicited messages appearing on the screen at inappropriate moments so I'll save that and that's the console configured there's this rc.site file they include it here you don't need to copy and paste this in it's these are the defaults it's all um, remarked out so it's got a hash in front of every line but you might want to go through there and uncomment some, some settings and there's some more information there about boot scripts so next we've got the um, some bash shell startup files and we can set the location here if we run this command it will tell us all the locales that are installed and you might recognize these as the ones that were installed um, when we installed glibc in chapter 8 there's a couple of extra system ones here such as this POSIX and C C.UTF the ones I'm interested in are these two here and what we can do to find some information that we need is to enter this command here with the locale name so the locale name I want to use is this one here and this will tell us the character map that we need to use so you can see it's ISO in capitals dash 8859-1 and that's in fact the example that's given in the book and you can run these commands to find out other information about the locale to ensure you are choosing the correct one in case there's subtle differences between some of them so we then want to create this file I'll do this bit by bit so it's easier to copy and paste so we want the LL is the language CC is the country modifier so that's this first part here followed by a full stop and then the result of this is pasted here and then the at symbol with any other modifiers I haven't got any other modifiers that I use so I'll just copy the end of that and I can display that and that's what the lang variable will be exported as the input RC file copy that in, just copy as it is that's done I can give you some extra hints to add to this which I find useful you may want to try um, if you go to the bottom um, I've got some extra settings I use to um, just aid me um, the first one I've got is um, to display extended information when auto completing so when I press tab this option here set visible hyphen stats on will print some extra information such as a star for an executable file or a forward slash for a directory so rather than just a list of names coming up when you press tab twice 
you'll get some hints as to what those file names are, what those names in the directory are, whether they are, they are another directory or an executable and so on. Um, now normally you have to press tab twice to get um, a display of all matches for ambiguous matches but this option set show all if ambiguous on will do the same but only after one tab so it just means that you can press tab one once rather than twice to get the list of all the files that match the um, file that you're trying to um, match with tab. Another one to do with the um, matching, the tab matching is to set completion ignore case on and basically that does, what that does is as it suggests it just ignores the case. So if you had two files called Fred, one was in uppercase, one was in lowercase, doesn't matter how you typed it, when you press tab, both of those will come up and obviously you'd have to match the correct one to get both of them. But say for example, you had one called Fred1 in uppercase and Fred2 in lowercase. If you typed it in in lowercase and you wanted Fred1, which is in uppercase, just by pressing the one and pressing tab again, it would automatically convert your lowercase that you typed in into uppercase because that matches with the uppercase of the Fred one. So that can be useful. And the last one that I've got, it just readjusts how the um, sorting, um, rather than going across the screen, it sets the sorting into vertical columns, which I find can be useful as well. And that is set print completion completions horizontally off. So I think I'm right in saying that these are all uh, bash uh, settings. So, um, like I say, you can try them out if you don't like them, just delete this or just change the setting in case you want to try it in the future. So I'll save them and we'll move on. Next thing we need to do is create a shells file to tell the system what shells we've got. And now we move on to the next part, which is making the system bootable.